Okay, so um, if you have questions, just uh, send them in through the chat uh, anytime. Uh, I will try to answer questions chat wise uh, throughout the presentation, but at, at the end, uh, make, I try to leave some room for some to answer some questions also. Uh, as Amy said, you know, we've been, uh, we're doing a series of presentations that uh, we're uh, or uh, identifying the EPT uh, taxa. And if you're not familiar with what EPT means, uh, that'd be ephemeroptera, plecoptera, and trichoptera. Uh, this presentation is focused on ephemeroptera. We're going to concentrate on uh, Missouri ephemeroptera or, or mayflies, uh, common name. Uh, we're going to review some of the morphological characteristics to help improve ID skills. And I, I, I have to admit that this is probably not the best way to, to ID, learn ID skills for mayflies, but since we are in this virtual world currently, that's this is how we're going to try to you know, share some of this. We're also going to, I'm also going to review some geographical distributions, which kind of helps determine, you know, helps you decide uh, what may be present or what may not be present. Uh, if you know a little bit about the ecology of, of uh, the organisms that you're looking at and, uh, and then a little bit about life history. And uh, as far as you know, this what's on this slide, we pretty much talked about this. Uh, Amy did in the first uh, presentation. Uh, what's important about macro, aquatic macroinvertebrates? Well, I think your answer has to be, you know, they're, they're a significant link in the aquatic food web. First of all, I mean, a lot of things, they, they convert uh, uh, detrital matter and algae to uh, animal tissue and then, and then they, they are food for other animals. Uh, first water quality trends go and long term trends. Uh, we use them as a tool uh, because they are relatively immobile and they give us sort of a, a little bit longer term picture about what's happening in a particular stream system or even a lake system. Um, and that could be a, a picture from the last several months, maybe the last six months or, ma or year, depending on how long the macroinvertebrates live. They also are uh, useful, a useful tool uh, for water quality in that they have a, a range of tolerances to pollution. And even within ephemeroptera, there is a range, but typically when we talk about EPT or that index or metric, uh, we are sort of recognizing ephemeroptera as being one of the more sensitive orders. Okay, thank you. Uh, as far as taxonomic classification goes, uh, again, definition for taxonomy, uh, classification of organisms into an ordered system. And this system is supposed to indicate natural relationships. A lot of the, of the taxonomy in the past has been morphological similarities between taxa or differences, as you could say. Uh, you geographical location is important, and you'll find that if you ask somebody, you know, to help you with an ID um, or uh, some suspected mayfly, say one of the first questions out of their mouth might be, "Where did you get it from?" And that kind of helps uh, in the determination. Uh, currently, you know, well, not currently, but maybe for the last mm, 10, 15 years, and even uh, it's picking up uh, even now, even more, uh, the genetic relationships are becoming a part of taxonomy. Um, that's probably the direction, you know, that a lot of taxonomy is headed in the future. Over on the right, Part of the slide is uh, just a review of the taxonomic classification system, which is again is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Uh, so far as mayflies go, we're, when we're talking kingdom, we're talking the animal kingdom or animalia. We're talking the arthropoda as the phylum, insecta as the class, and of course, ephemeroptera as the order. Today, we're gonna talk about the different families. 
that are within the, the order Ephemeroptera. Okay, thank you. Okay, so characteristics uh, for Ephemeroptera nymphs, uh, what we'll be talking about today and the things that you need to be able to see there. A uh, good thing about the, at the family level is that we don't need a whole lot of magnification to ID at the family level. There are a few instances where we're probably going to need about 10x uh, magnification, but I think we could get by with that at family level. So we're going to talk about the fact that they have abdominal gills and then what are the shape of those gills and the location or whether they're present or absent or the type of gills. We're also going to talk about the cerci or at the end of the abdomen. Um, so how many do they have? Uh, sometimes we use the term tails for the for cerci or other people even use the term filaments. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, the wing pads uh, on the thoracic segments. And in mayflies, you only see one pair of, of wing pads, but there are actually two pairs. Uh, the one pair is found, it's, it's located underneath the other set. Uh, so we need to talk a, a little bit about the two do family level identifications, we need to talk a little bit about the thoracic segments uh, and the wing pads. We also need to talk a little bit about uh, the legs and the claws on the legs and maybe even the parts of the leg, which are, you know, divided into femur, uh, uh, tibia and tarsi. Uh, another thing that's on that's illustrated here is um, we we'll probably need to touch on is the visible antenna and maybe the length of those antenna. And, and finally, as far as this slide goes, you know, just overall body form, whether it's streamlined or flattened. And those characteristics, as far as this slide goes, will, will probably get us pretty all of all the almost all the way down the road for identifying mayflies at the family level. Next slide, please. Okay, the only additional thing that we probably we maybe need to see at the family level is a little bit on the way of mouth parts. So again, as a review uh, on the right hand side, you see kind of a, a, a slide, a, a photo of a straight down looking into the mouth parts of a mayfly nymph. Uh, the top, top structure is the labrum. And then there's a set of mandibles as we go down, uh, and then a set of maxilla and the lab labium. So over on the left-hand side, you can see close-up photos of uh, those mouth parts. Uh, the one on the top far left being the labrum. And that's just, this is just one example of a labrum. They actually, you know, uh, have different shapes and whether they have a notch there or not, but, uh, this comes in, you know, these characteristics can come into play identification at the genus and species level, where the where the CDR, the shape of the labrum, et cetera. The top middle and right photos are the mandibles, and uh, they have different shapes and structures too. The bottom left photo, uh, maxilla, and that's one thing that we're going to need today to see. Uh, whether there is a comb, kind of a comb shape, a comb set of CD on the maxilla or not. And on this maxilla, you can see uh, there's a palp uh, coming off the side of it. The, the bottom right photo uh, is, well, only one palp is showing on the far left. So that's a labial palp, and they have different shapes and sizes. And then more toward the right would be the paraglossa and then the glossa. Okay, so those are basic things that we need to, to know at the family level. Next slide. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about adults much as folk, folks is mainly on nymphs, but there are 
there are interesting things for sure about adults and people that fly fish probably are more interested in the in the adults. Um, but as far as their life cycle goes, uh, like we've said before, they have incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, in other words, if you look in the, you know, uh, the arrows there, they just have an egg stage. Uh, they, they, the egg hatches and then there's a, a different instars of nymphs and they can go up, up to 25 instars. So that's a molt, that's different molts uh, as the nymph grows. Uh, and then when the emerges, uh, when the, it's ready to, uh, to go to a wing stage, to terrestrial stage, the, the first, the first, uh, time it molts as a wing stage it, and an, as an adult, it would be called a sub imago and, uh, and fly fishing speak. I believe this is called done. And, you know, and they have a smoky colored wing that's because a lot of hairs will find hairs on the wings. They're not sexually mature and they, they need to go through another molt and it takes maybe, you know, a few hours or less than a, less than an hour or sometimes, a, you know, maybe half, uh, throughout the night, but this stage doesn't, the sub stage doesn't last very long. And then finally, they will become an adult imago, which is sexually mature. And I believe spinner is the name here. And if I, if I understand that with that term, right, I think, uh, that's from the spent females, mostly probably on the water as, uh, as they're, they've laid their eggs and they're laying on the surface of the water spinning around. Somebody might correct me on that. I'm not a fly fisherman, so, uh, I can't really speak. Uh, fly fish very well. Okay, so the there's an example of an adult here uh, on the left, that photo. Uh, at the end of the abdomen, where you see those cerci or those tails, right at the end of the abdomen, there would be for males there would be uh, that that would be where they they have a male appendages. And this middle photograph shows the basic shape of those male appendages on the out, you know, you can see these long finger like, uh. Structures to call forceps or claspers. That's what they would grab the female. With. They grab the female around the abdomen and then in the center. Uh, uh, it's not a very, very, uh, visible in the central photograph in the center photograph. But if you look into the far right, that is the structure that's more in the center. And that's called the penis, and it has a distinctive shape uh, of the lobes, the overall size, and even the spines that you can see on there. So the taxonomy of mayflies in the past has been based on adult was based on adults, under the theory that uh, these sexual structures here were unique and unique to particular species. So uh, that's shifted a lot in. And currently, you know, so nymphs are used a lot now, uh, but or and or both nymphs and adults. Okay, next. Okay, so ephemeroptera, ephemeroptera diversity in the United States, there's 22 recognized families. Uh, in Missouri, we have published records for 17. And if you broke that down into genera and species, we'd have 52 genera within those 17 families and 110 plus species. Uh, the list is standing right at a little over 110 right now, but it probably would probably could go up a few, you know, uh, maybe maybe 10 more taxa or or even more over time. Next. Uh, like I said, I hope that you were able to uh, download the key. I'm going to kind of I'm following this key uh, during the presentation, so the slides, you know, kind of follow. I just follow the key, you know, in the order of the slides. Uh, the, the Missouri key is based on the aquatic aquatic animal book by Cafferty, published in 1981, and you wouldn't think that. If family level taxonomy would change all that much, but for mayflies, it has changed a little bit since 1981. 
in that the, the splitters have been at work mostly. And there are so there are three new families that are not in McCafferty, McCafferty and one family name change. OK, so one caveat about using keys, and this is always true with keys, is that uh, they're made from mature specimens. So if you collect uh, like half grown or quarter grown specimens, their characteristics are prob probably not developed enough to for most people to run them through a key. Um, so especially for this, the primary characteristic in the first couplet, you need a fairly mature organism. Uh, and that first couplet has to do with this big split that McCafferty uses uh, of, of fused backs that he calls pan that are called panoda versus split backs versus sh and called schistonoda. Uh, so that is couplet one, and you don't if they aren't mature, you still have a option in the key in one. Uh, to go with gills, so it's not you don't absolutely have to have a, a fully developed uh, uh, nymph to use the key, but it, it surely helps. Uh, just a little explanation about the key, and it, it is a dichotomous key, so there are two choices for each couplet. And if you if you if you have it in front of you, you'll notice that for the first couplet and every every couplet after that, but for one there is a one. And a one prime, so those I, I refer to those. I'll refer to those times. So you, that's your two choices, and those send you off, depending on which one you select, send you off to the fused back group or the split back group. Next, please. Okay, so the the fused backs or the panoda group are made up of these five families. So it's Betiscidae, Ephemeralidae, Leptohyphidae, Neoephemeridae, and Cenidae. I don't know if you're getting the drift that they all end in DAE, or that is a designation for family uh, in, in taxonomy. There are, and you also see that I have the common names here. I think that's more mayfly, or you know, more fly fish speak. Um, I don't use these common names a whole lot, but they make it, they make a lot of sense because, you know, they usually kind of key in on a characteristic that you can easily observe. So, for example, down on the bottom two square guild mayflies. So that's, uh, that actually is kind of a characteristic. Next. Okay, so if you don't choose the good, if your key doesn't lead you to the fused backs or the panoda, you're going to head off towards schistonoda, and that is a larger group. So the first in schistonoda, this group breaks out uh, first after you get the schistonoda, and these are burrowers. So these four families are considered burrowing mayflies. So that's ephemeridae, palingeniidae, potamanthidae, and polymetarsidae. And notice that most of them have burrowers in their common name. Next. Okay, the rest of the schistonoda, not burrowers. Uh, it's just a variety of different shapes and forms of mayflies. Uh, so we've got uh, what, eight more here. Uh, Leptophlebiidae, Isonychiidae, Oligonuriidae, Pseudoronidae, Eptogeniidae, Betidae, Amelidae, and Cyphlonuriidae. Uh, and then you can look at common names, and sometimes they give you an indication, like I said, of the characteristic that kind of, you know, really stands out for that family. Like for the second one down, I see Nickiidae, and matter of fact, for Oligonuriidae, brush legged mayflies. So that might tell you something right there that. Brush legged, there's going to be hairs on the legs, uh, and that is a that is a, a significant characteristic. Next, please. Okay, families that we're not going to talk about because they're not found in Missouri. There's five more. Uh, so next. Okay, the first family, and if you're working your way through the key, I'm gonna gonna. 
I'm going to talk about the characteristics at first, just so you get used to uh, get kind of get used to following the key. Uh, all I've done here on the left hand side is I've picked out the the couple parts of the couplets that you would choose. So really, as you go down, as you go down through the key, this is going to get longer actually. Um, but you are so are in a way you're de developing developing sort of a description of that family of mayfly also by the characteristics that you would choose. Okay, so for again, like I told you, like the first couplet number one, your choice is the split backs versus the fused backs. So number one says thoracic, thoracic robust with notum fused between four wing pads uh, and the fact that gills on abdominal segment two either absent, concealed, or operculate. That's the one we're choosing as opposed to one prime. Now, when it says uh, notum, a notum is essentially just uh, the exoskeleton part of the thorax. And the, in this case, may, you know, notum means kind of an extended shield-like cover um, of the carapace. So you can see these are unique individuals, the, the, the Betiscidae. They have uh, a, their notum is very extended. It covers part of the abdomen. And so if you look at that key, that number one characteristics that the gills, in this case, on segment two, on abdominal segment two, would be covered. You can't even see abdominal segment two unless you kind of look underneath the, the notum. So that, that character works, but you have to know where to look for the gills. And um, I guess one, I guess one uh, hint or one word of advice if you're trying to count abdominal segments and in, in mayflies that you probably it's number one segment is closest to the thorax and number 10 is at the end of the abdomen and it's probably best to count backwards starting with number you can find number 10 fairly easy sometimes it's not so easy to find the first segment so if you start with number 10 and count backwards that's how i would recommend in finding segment two for sure Okay, so the number one you would choose um, on number one here, straight out number one, not one prime. It sends you to number two, and uh, these are fairly distinct: thoracic notum carapace-like. So, we, um, this family has one gene. Oh, that's go ahead, advance, please. Uh, Betiscidae has one genus in Missouri, or one genus period, Betisca. Uh, we have three species in Missouri. Um, if you kind of remember what they look like, uh, they're not very good swimmers. They're kind of compact and uh, they're not designed to, you know, swim well. Um, so they're, they are found most commonly, especially when they're more mature, along the edges of the stream and then stream margins. The nice thing, well, the interesting thing about them is they're, they are sensitive though. They have a, on a biotic index scale, I think we explained this last time in the beginning uh, presentation that this biotic index scale is zero is the most sensitive, 10 is the most tolerant. So on this scale, this is a three, which, you know, from the considered a sensitive. You can see there's populations here uh, up in northern Missouri, the red dots on the map uh, in the Ozarks, and there's even a dot down in the Mississippi alluvial plain, or commonly we call Boot Hill. Well, this doesn't tell you a lot of information, of course. You know, a lot of these slides, as far as geographic uh, distribution, this doesn't tell you a lot at the family level. In this case, I mean, you'd probably want to know, well, what? What genus is it or what species is it? And if you look at the next slide, 
uh, you can see that, well, that one record down in the boot hill, that was a particular species called B. Tisco. Doesn't occur in the rest of the part of the state, the rest of the state. Uh, however, like if you're looking at another species, B. Tisco lacustris on the right side, uh, they're pretty well distributed in the prairie and the Ozarks. Next. Okay, so moving on in that one group, the, the panoda or the fused backs, uh, we're going to stick with uh, our, our choice in the dichotomous key on one is going to be the same here. It's going to be the first part of the couplet with that thorax robust and notum fused. I don't know if you, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time here pointing. I was kind of counting on pointing it, pointing things out. This is going to be tough because I can't point. But if you look at this ephemerality and you look at its wing pads, you'll notice that they are not split very much of the way. The, the, the notum comes back and this is a well-developed nymph, pretty mature nymph. And the tips of those wing pads only stick out a little bit. They're, they're fused in a, lo a lot along their longitudinally along the wing pads. So that's what it means by panoda or fused backs. Okay, so here gills are important. Well, I mean, once we're into the group, the fused backs, then we have other characteristics that we need to use, and that's going to be the gills. Uh, so moving from if we go to two, couplet two, we would, in this case, want two prime. Because, uh, again, thoracic notum not covering most of the abdomen, like in betiscidae. And then we're going to move to three. And on this case, gills on abdominal segment two are absent. So if you look at the bottom left photo, and you, these, these segments are numbered for you. So if you look at one and two, and you will not see any lateral gills nor gill scars or anything like a gill got knocked off or anything like that. There is an operculate gill on the posterior end of segment three. And here's an operculate gill is like a hard covering gill, a harder gill. There are softer, more filamentous gills underneath, but this operculate gill is sort of a protective gill. So they do have a gills on abdominal segment two, or I mean, pardon me, gills on abdominal segment two absent. They have gills starting on abdominal segment three. Okay. Uh, if, interesting thing about ephemerality at the family level, Geography tells you quite a bit here, the geographic distribution. If you see where we've had, we've gotten, uh, we have records here for, for uh, ephemerality, uh, pretty much an Ozark critter. That's because they pretty much prefer cool water or cold water and well oxygenated water. So um, we have five genera. It's not that they're, you know, not diverse. We have a fair amount of diversity in ephemerality, but they're not all that common. Uh, and if you look down at the bottom at the biotic in index value, you know, they're probably one of the more sensitive families of, of mayflies in Missouri with a biotic index value of one. Next. Okay, continuing on in that fused back group. Uh, again, with number the first couplet, we're we're going to stick with just the number one, not the one prime. It's going to send us to number two. Uh, in this case, we're going to go on to number three. And in number three, we're choosing three prime gills on abdominal segment two present and operculate. So we do have gills on segment two here, and they are operculate. Now, now we look at shape. 
Now, it's like I was telling you before, you know, it's like with gills, it's where they are, what segments they're on. They couldn't be, they can be on segments one through seven. They don't have to be. And also, if they're a percolate or not, the shape of the gills. And in this case, they have an apercolate gill that's triangular in shape. Not sure you can actually see that triangular shape, but uh, probably the best photo I have that picks that out probably is the bottom left one here. Okay, next. So as far as leptohyphidae, uh, there's one genus in Missouri. I don't know how many species there are. There's <laughs> they're a tough one. You know, to, to identify the species, especially the nymphs are. I'm thinking that you probably, here's a case where you would need to look at adults probably. Um, they are common, fairly, very common. They hatch in large numbers. They, they tend to fly in the morning. They're mating flights in the like mid morning. That's a little bit unusual for mayflies. Uh, a lot of mayflies will fly, you know, during for their mating flight in the evening or even at night. Uh, they are often partially buried in fine substrate. And then you kind of, if you kind of remember what I said about opercolate gills, they're protective, uh, like a hardened cover, operculum, a hardened cover over the more functional gills. So that is a little bit protective far as sediment goes. They can tolerate more sediment. And as you see, their biotic index value is a five, which is kind of mid range, moderately tolerant. And you can see from the distribution map that, yeah, they're pretty much all over Missouri. Next. Okay, so uh, there, are, there are two more fused backs here. One of them uh, is neoephemeridae. And uh, like I said, I'm going to get away from going through all the characteristics here and just kind of deal with, point out the, the characteristics at the end uh, that kind of distinguish it from other others in that larger group. And in this case, that's that panota group or the fused backs. Um, if you Look further down uh, in the character on the characteristics on the left hand side. In this case, uh, they do have gills on segment two, but they are operculate gills and they are a square shape. So this is one of those square gill mayflies, that common name, quadrate or square shape. And if you look at the bottom photo, I don't think you can really tell, but you probably would have to manipulate the gills a little bit to tell, be able to tell that they are fused together. So those two opercular gills do not come apart. They are, they are fused and would kind of move as one. That's a key characteristic. And then all in all, these are a little bit bigger than some of the other uh, fused backs. Next. So, far as neoephemeridae goes, <laughs> well, one species in Missouri, uh, neoephemera bicolor, uh, that was the gas, we got it out of the Gasconade River quite a while, while ago when I was, uh, during a, a study that a big oil spill there. So, I'm calling them fairly rare. Uh, however, they might, in this case, rare might be mean. Uh, they're larger river species and they're just hard to sample. It's really hard to tell, you know, whether they're, when things are hard to sample in bigger rivers, it's really hard to tell whether they're actually rare or they're just rarely sampled. So I do think they are clingers and they, they are, of course, like I said, the largest of the square gills. Next. Okay, so the last, uh, family in the fused backs is Cenidae. And again, you know, a lot of the choices in the cup in the key are the same here. You're, you're just kind of moving down through some of those same choices until you get to 
the latter part of the of uh, towards four and five. Uh, again, these gills are a percolate. They're on segment two. They're those hardened type of cover covered gills, uh, percolate gills. And in this case, uh, at five, you you would choose five prime and the gills on abdominal segment two are not fused together, but they're overlapping. And these are much smaller, you know, than the neoephemera too. But the thing about size is <laughs> saying things are smaller and larger, it's all relative. You know, like at some point in time, you know, everything's small. Uh, so when I say, when I'm saying small, large or whatever, I'm talking about mature individuals. And, you know, you pretty much have to have them side by side in order to get any kind of idea at all about their size. Next, please. So, Cena D, uh, they're fairly diverse in Missouri. They have four, there's four genera. Uh, some of them like sandy streams in the north. Uh, and then, again, the most common genus is Cenus, and, and they occur all over the, the state. So they're really common. Uh, they're unique, sort of unique in that they're one of the more short lived as adults. They mate, uh, their mating flights are at night. Uh, if you're at light, like we, we were talking about earlier before the presentation started about light trapping, uh, you're definitely going to get uh, seen as mayflies, really small white may, uh, the adults. Uh, and when I say shortest lived is, you know, they're going to mate during the night and they're done by daylight. And so that's, that's it for them as far as adults go. Just that night. Uh, biotic index value, you know, around 7. So the, they are turn they turn out to be 1 of the more tolerant. Uh, Mayfly families and they're. Especially tolerant of sediment. Next, please. Okay, so now we're done with the fused packs. If uh, we were going to go, if we were going to key out any of the fall, the rest of the families here in the first couplet of the key, we would be choosing one prime. And that's where four wing pads are free, separate for half their length or more. And then the gills on abdominal segment two present, but they're variable. They're never operculate. And matter of fact, when we get into this group of burrowers, if we go down to to six, where it sends the one prime sends us to six, abdominal gills two through seven, they're double. So there's two gills at each where each one is attached. And they're elongate and they have a fringed margin. So I just call them fancy gills. They are pretty fancy. A lot of times the burrowers, most of these burrowers are hold those gills up over their back. Because again, I'm saying burrowers, right? They make most of these make a tube. So they, you know, they they excavate out a tube in clay and they actually can circulate water through that tube. For food and or oxygen, and they use the gills to do that. So they kind of flick their gills while they're in their tube, and that creates a, a circulation of water through the tube. Okay, so if you go to, then you finally go to seven once you get past the gills, and then it's modified mouth parts here. These are mandibular tusks, or so there's a modification of the mandibles. And uh, so it's a matter of looking at these tusks and what shape are they and where are the spines present if they have spines on the tusk? Uh, where are those spines? So if you look at the bottom left, you'll see that these mandibular tusks are kind of curved in the upward direction. And, and according to the key, they don't have spines on the distal half, so that's the far half away from the body. Next. Okay, so ephemeridae, the family, two genera in Missouri, burrowers and lots of places. 
lakes, streams, rivers, ponds, you know, practically anywhere, uh, as long as the water quality is pretty fair. Uh, they can have these huge synchronous hatches and synchronous, of course, being, you know, all pretty much all at once. It's not necessarily all at the same day, but it's within a week period, maybe, or something, and where you're getting a lot of individuals coming, emerging, you know, each day. Um, they are common. They are large. Uh, and you can see in my bullet points here, you know, up to 35 millimeters in length. So pretty good size. These are the biggest mayflies. Uh, and it's, you know, biotic index value around four, unless you're talking about one of the gene, the genera, which is ephemera. And that one is more sensitive at a biotic index value of two. Next, please. So here, it's kind of interesting to break it down. Ever occasionally here, even though we're talking about families, here's the two genera that we're talking about in Missouri, hexagenia versus ephemera. And as you can see, you know, the ephemera are almost exclusive to the Ozarks. We've got a dot up there in Northeast Missouri, and it just so happens that we've got some, some streams, very rocky, streams with a little groundwater input up along the, their tributaries to the Mississippi River. They're kind of outliers sometimes as far as the aquatic fauna. But hexagenia on the left pretty much occur everywhere in Missouri. There's there's a, several species in that genus though. Next. Well, when I talked about synchronous hatches, uh, one of the more interesting little tidbits about hexagenia, or you know, you can see in these photos, is they have, in the past, they have, have had some huge hatches along the Mississippi River. Um, the bottom left is a radar image. So these these hatches will show up on radar. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the right. Bottom right, uh, USGS has a has a website for tracking these when they do emerge during the summertime, uh, and there's some information, some neat information there. Um, and then you can see from the handful of hexagenia that it's not just everywhere that you can walk up and you know the next day you know grab a handful of dead dead mayflies. That's quite a quite a few mayflies. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this before or not, but uh, they they are attracted to light, and that's one of the pro problems uh, that people have is that on over the Mississippi on lighted bridges, they can there can be so many of the hexagenia that get attracted to light and then fall down on the bridge that and they're pretty squishy, you know. So after they're run over a, a few times by cars. The bridges actually get slick enough sometimes that they have to close the bridges bridge for a few uh, a few hours just to avoid uh, accidents. Next, okay, another burrower, Palingenidae. Um, again, uh, we're at uh, one prime headed towards six, and then we have these double gills, the fancy fringed gills. And here it comes down to when we get to eight, it's a matter of the shape of the tusk. And in this case, uh, and where spines are. So the tusk on this case, as you see, a little bit different than the hexagenia or the eph ephemerity, and uh, it has an outer keel along the tusk and um, spines. It says tusk on head with spines on the distal half. So you have have some spines out toward the distal half. It's not real obvious to see them in the photos. Um, but that's how you would key out, you know, this family. Next. Okay, uh, much different, <laughs> much different uh, distribution map here as, as opposed to the ephemerity. Um, we only have a couple, not that we haven't collected these more, but uh, this is kind of outside where we collect at the bio for biological assessments. And that's the records I'm showing you. 
And so these are just uh, going to occur in larger rivers. And then these two data points that are on this map are, are from the Missouri River. So uh, there's one genus, Pentagenia, uh, with two species found in North America. And one of those species has recently de been declared extinct. So the one species we have is, the, is it. But like I mentioned before, in large rivers, uh, they are, I don't think these are rare. They are just rarely sampled. Next. Another burrower, they're throwing in the burrower category, but they're a little different than the, uh, this family is a little different than the other three. Uh, Potamanthidae, you can see from the looks of them that they do have the mandibular tusk. They do have the fancy gills, uh, the really fringed gills. But in this case, as we work our way down through the key, uh, the tusk, uh, not necessarily that different in shape, but when it gets to the late, you know, the couplet talk ninth, number nine, and talking about the legs and the gills, in this case, they're, we're saying they are outspread, spread out not the gills are not held over their back because they really don't uh, form these tube type burrows in in clay and, and hard sediments. Next. So why are they called burrowers then if they don't form the tube? Well, uh, the third bullet point down says, you know, generally do not burrow, but the young larva may be in, found in coarse substrate. They do burrow down in the substrate. They just not tube makers, though. So we have one genus, Anthopotamus, uh, and mostly find those in large, you know, moderate to to large rivers, and a biotic index y, value wise about a four, moderately sensitive. And if you see from the map, uh, you know, more or less an Ozark. Uh, type of critter here. I've got a few outlying records, you know, a little bit north of the Ozarks, but uh, that's where predominantly we, you would find them. Next. Okay, the last burrowing family, Polymetarsity. Again, uh, same couplets at, at first, you know, we're headed towards uh, this family of burrowers, these, these schistonoda, the split backs. So in this case, you can even see, you know, the, the photo's good enough on the vertebrae on the top left that you can see the wings are split. You know, you, there's a there's a quite a split between the two wing pads. Uh, they do have the fancy gills. They hold up over their back. They have a little bit different shape of uh, tusk. And that's and, and the characteristics and the spines that go along with that. And it comes down to once you get to eight prime or number or the eighth couplet, uh, tusk with scattered or inner spines and downward or inward curved tips. So it's you know you can tell from the bottom right photo, you know, that these if you're looking at these tusks laterally. You know that they do have a different shape to them. They're not some of them are, uh, like I said in the first one, ephemerity. They were curved upwards. These are curved inwards and sort of down. And then where where are the spines at? So I still think you know, I'm still saying 10x at magnification can can probably get you to the family level. But like I've said before. Uh, I, I don't think you can do this with live critters. I don't think they're going to, uh, you know, most of these are going to be very cooperative, you know, and for you, for you to see the characteristics you need to see, you know, to identify the family level. Next, please. Okay, so far as polymetarsity goes, as far as some of their ecological characteristics, we, we have two genera in Missouri. Uh, again, they are burrowers more in the tubes, uh, tube burrowers. Uh, one of these genera, actually, uh, Tortibus, uh, actually likes 
like larger rivers, burrows over toward in the banks. They like vertical banks, uh, and they they make this little they make actually honeycomb. They're pretty common. They'll make this just honeycomb a tube is back in a vertic this clay banks, and uh, I was able to sample some of these by going down to the the river here in Jefferson City. And and the river it was down lower, and so and it had dropped recently, and you could you could dig them out of the banks. Uh, they're a little bit susceptible to rivers like the Missouri, you know, where the levels are controlled by dams a lot in in the upper part of the river. You know, the it's the levels. I'm not going to say they drop real rapidly, but they can fluctuate uh, more when there are dams. Than, than what it is natural. So they have a tough time some years. Some years they're common when the water stays up, but if the dro water drops a lot, you know, that leaves their burrows kind of high and dry along the bank. And in case we uh, rarely sample them because of their habitat, large rivers, and they mer emerge mo for the most part during the middle of the summer. And that's not when we typically sample for bioassessment samples. The interesting thing about tortopus, the adults of tortopus, and both of these photos in the bottom left are adult tortopus. They're real white colored, real light colored. Uh, they're attracted to lights. And if you look real hard at the photo on the left, you can see that this uh, adult, I think this is a male, I'm pretty sure, but only can see four legs there. You can see the wings and you can see the four legs, but you don't easily see the middle and, and hind set of legs the on the meta and mesothorax. And uh, I I try to get a decent photo of this even the bottom, even one on the right. And you know it's it's hard to see those legs that I'm talking about the because they are act, they are there, but they're actually they're kind of what we call vestigial or kind of shriveled up. Uh, this th these poor guys uh, they live as long as they fly. When they they come out, they emerge in after dark. And if they try, if they do like come, and they they hit the ground at light or something like that. They cannot even stand up, and so they'll just spin in a circle. They can't take off again. They have these vestigial legs, and they have, they're another mayfly with these very short adult lifespans. So they, as long as they can fly and they find each other and mate, that's their, the, that's their extent of their adult life that evening. They're, they're pretty strong flyers, apparently, though. I, I, uh, as far as in, in Missouri goes, I've found them at the tennis court lights in Columbia. And for those of you that are familiar with Columbia, the tennis courts and the university are pretty far from the river. I mean, there's miles there. So they are apparently able to get up into the wind, you know, into the wind currents and kind of travel a little ways. Next. Okay, so now we're, if we were, again, we're at the split backs. If uh, we went to, uh, from one prime to six, uh, then we would be, we would go to 10 uh, from there. And here we have a family left of Flibia D that uh, has somewhat fancy gills. They they have forked gills. They're not near as fancy as like a burrower where they're all fringed and everything like that, but they're not a simple plate-like gill either. So that's the characteristic that we would need to see. Unfortunately, gills get knocked off sometimes and so that it's not so easy and if you're if you're collecting them roughly. Uh, but at number 10, we would we would go with just the plain 10, not 10 prime. And that Gills on abdominal segment two through five forked or double and elongate or with finger like projections or in clusters of filaments and never ventral. Uh, anyway, so that we use gills, you know, to distinguish this family. Next. 
there are four genera of Leptophlebiidae in Missouri. Uh, they range from swimmers to clingers and sprawlers. They're diverse. Uh, they're diverse. They have they come in divert. They're found in diverse habitats and stream sizes. Their average biotic index value is around two. So you know they're. Uh, that sounds sensitive, but when you take into account four genera, uh, that can actually range from moderately uh, sensitive to, to highly pollution sensitive. And if you look in the distribution map, you can see they're you know, pretty much at the family level. They're spread all across Missouri. Some of these, uh, some of the genera and some of the species here are, are really well adapted to really small streams, uh, streams that dry out, little headwater streams. Uh, others found in uh, larger rivers, medium-sized streams. Next. Okay, probably one of the more interesting, I'll have to say, uh, mayflies, uh, they're fairly good size. You can see in Isonicity, you can see it fairly easy. Uh, I guess they're, they get attention because you know they're fair, they're pretty good swimmers. I don't know if you can tell that from their shape or not, but uh, they're called large minnow mayflies, and uh, that's what you're going to notice about them if you collect them in a net or put them in water or something like that. Is they're they're pretty fast swimmers. If you're going to key them out, uh, of course we're headed we're in that fuse or split back group. Uh, we go one to six to ten, and it sends us to eleven. Now we have eleven. We have four legs with two rows of long hairs. So, like I said, leg characteristics, and uh, in this case, the CD on the legs or the hairs on the legs are a distinguishing feature. So they have these two rows of, of hairs, and they use those the brush-legged mayflies. They use those to collect. Uh, detritus in the stream and they feed off those hairs, what they collect on the hairs. Um, if we go on to 12, we tell an Isonychidae from a few other families, uh, the gills on a segment one are dorsal lateral and they're similar to the other gills. So they pretty much all the gills kind of look basically the same, same position, same looks. Uh, and the Fi fibrous port or the fibrils are shorter than the gill plates. I don't know if you can tell from the photo that the there is a plate-like part of the gill and then a fibrous structure uh, part of the gill underneath that plate. Those are not a percolate. That's you know these are all functional part of the gills. Next. Okay. We have three species found in, in that are in one genus in Missouri. Uh, like I said before, streamlined bodies, really good swimmers. They're common in swift streams and rivers. Uh, they live in, if, as you might guess, they probably prefer riffles. Actually, uh, they can swim well enough, you know, to to survive in the riffles, and they. In general, but among these three species, we would give them a for the whole family in Missouri, give them a biotic index value of four. But the one more common Isonychia species, which is bicolor, that are that's found in the Ozarks, is is more sensitive, and we get, and it has a biotic index value of two. Next. Well, definitely some of the more interesting uh, mayflies are ones we don't run across very often. And I don't know if that just makes them interesting or uh, it, it probably does to me. I mean, it's just hard to come by this family. This is one of the families, Oliganuriidae. Uh, these are large river mayflies. And so that's probably a lot of the reason why they're, you know, we don't know a lot about them. If you're trying to ID them, if you do happen to get some samples from Big River, uh, number one, you probably were trying uh, at a boat or uh, or even knew where to wade out when the river was low. 
to a sandbars or something. Uh, if you're trying to identify them, again, we're in the split back group and we're going from one prime to six prime to 10 prime. When we get to 11, we have, again, we have those four legs with two rows of long hairs, just like the Isonychiidae. As a matter of fact, these used to be lumped together. This is one of the groups that was split apart. Isonychiidae and Oligonuriidae were split in their own families. Um, if we get to 12, how would we tell them apart since they both have hairs, these long sets of hairs on their front, on their forelegs? We tell them apart based upon gills. And the gills on segment one in Oligonuriidae are ventral. If you remember for Isonychiidae, they were all lateral, you know, like dorsal lateral gills along the side. These have these fibrous gills, you know, on segment one on the ventral side. I would highly encourage, you know, if, if you, uh, if you're interested, we can send a link out uh, to uh, a newsletter called May. Uh, well, it's a Mayfly <laughs> newsletter um, that has some very nice photographs. They aren't mine. I can't really share them on the PowerPoint, but uh, Greg Courtney in Iowa, in Iowa uh, has taken some very, very nice photographs of, uh, of some of these large river mayflies that are people rarely get to see, actually. But these Oligonuriidae, we have the one genus and two species probably in Missouri. Um, they're rarely sampled, like I said, and because they inhabit large sandy rivers and they're just hard to sample. And there's some indication here that these guys, at least part of the time, might be predators. This is kind of an exception for, for mayflies because most mayflies are uh, scrapers for out on algae or detrital feeders where they're just collecting detritus and eating it. So that's, it's rarely, it's uh, an exception for mayflies to be predator. Next. Okay, another family that don't get to see very often, maybe more common than we think. Again, you know, maybe just because we can't sample them very well. The Pseudoronidae, and uh, again, I think this this at some time since 1981, this one was also split off and became its own family. Uh, I think Heptogeniidae and and Pseudoronidae were joined at what were combined at one time. But if you're trying to trying to uh, key these out, again, we're headed down the path of the split backs. Uh, I go one prime, six prime, ten prime, eleven prime. Eventually, we get to the what well, we have to decide if the body is distinctly flattened, with hor the head held horizontal and the legs outspread. And this, these guys are flattened. I don't know if you'd call them you'd call them distinctly flattened, but I I, I would go towards more flattened than more streamlined uh, shape. And so once you make that choice in the uh, in the key. You end up at 14 and here's where the, the leg structure uh, comes into play. You, at the bottom right uh, photograph, and if you, you can kind of look at that photograph and read in the, the couplet, claws as long as or longer than the tarsi. So they have pretty long claws, okay? And, and the tarsi are bowed. So you got the curved shape to the tarsi too. Really long claws and this curved tarsi. These are kind of really unique to, again, photo, the photographs, you know, kind of give you an idea of what they do, but uh, large river, sandy substrate, long claws all kind of go together because they can stick the long claws down in the sandy substrate and on their bent they could get in, but you know, and there's current on the bottom. It's not quite as strong as at the surface, but there's still quite a bit of current in places, but they can plant themselves with the claws in the sand and face upstream. And they have this very unique, as it's been described, this very unique way of feeding is that they tilt their body 
down a little bit uh, and it creates a little vortex underneath their head and they just sit there and watch and watch for mids larvae or whatever. So again, these guys are predators and they have a very unique feeding. Uh, okay, next please. There's one genus, one species, Missouri. You, you look at the records in this map, you see we don't have very many records. In this case, there's two dots down, way down southeast Missouri, and those are from the Mississippi River. They're probably more common than that, but like I said, hard to collect. Those records were actually collected with a, a benthic trawl. So it's a they they weren't really going for the mayflies, they were going for Stuff, other stuff that lives on the bottom, but that's how they were collected. Okay, so next family, Heptogenia D. Heptogenia D. Um, these are that. These are the. You can look at them, and there's the typical flattened form. I think that people might agree when you just look at these. Kind of sometimes I think the common name for these is flathead mayflies, but they have an overall flattened form. And so working our way down to the key, you know, we we get we're working down to 13 and that's body distinctly flat with horizontal head and outspread legs. And so I think most people would agree that that's the way that these guys look. And then that would send us on to 14 and now we'd still we need to look at the claws and the tibia to tell, you know, to distinguish these from the Pseudoronidae. And so they have shorter claws, you know, and the tibia isn't bowed. Next. So these are a diverse group in Missouri. And I think most people, if you sampled it all in, in most any kind of smaller or medium sized stream in a riffle, you've probably seen these. Uh, there are six genera found in Missouri. They ha they are most of them, I believe, probably scrapers, but uh, we're also calling some of them collectors. Um, the biotic index value is a prop, you know, for the whole family, but it's a diverse family. You know, it's going to average out about four. But then again, if you looked at, you know, we can get better information if you can identify to a lower level. Like if you can identify these guys as species. One of the more common, most common mayflies, I think that you can find is Anonyma femoratum. It's one of the most common in North America, and it is a more tolerant mayfly. And uh, the map overall, since a diverse family, that the map really doesn't do you a lot of good unless you would just break break this family further down to tell where where particular genera are found or where particular species are found. Next. So Randy, I did have a quick question from Ron. Um, going back to the pseudonary, um, when they're predators, what is their primary prey? I think, I believe, you know, the literature's saying it's probably anything that'll fit in their mouth. But, uh, I'm going to guess, you know, based on their size, you know, that and what lives in big sandy rivers is that midge larvae are a favorite. And and possibly any worms, aquatic worms. Um, I'm not sure anybody's really done any kind of analysis on what they actually what they eat, but you'd have to look and you know, you got to think what's common in, you know, large sandy rivers and. Uh, a lot of things eat midges. That's a, that's a good guess, I think, in any case. Okay, continuing on with the uh, split backs. And you can see in this photo, uh, this may fly in the, at the top photo there. You can tell, you can see the wing pads and the fact that they are for, you know, split for about half their length or so. So, like I was telling you, uh, saying before, fairly mature organisms always work out better when you're trying to use a key. Now, 
like I said, also said, you know, as we're working our way down through the key, our list of characteristics gets longer as we get toward the toward the bottom here. So, um, but basically we're in that split back group. So we go one prime, six prime, 10 prime, 11 prime. Uh, and then we ended up at 13 prime, 13. And then we go with 13 prime, which is body elongate and streamlined. Head is vertical. Heads attached vertical rather than horizontal. So it's body shape now uh, between the flat headed mayflies or the flattened form versus the more streamlined form. Okay, this we we go on to 15. And here, yeah, here's this family's tough. Let me just say that. Because it, it's diverse for one thing. And the other there's exceptions here. You know, almost all mayflies have in the nymphal form have three three cerci or three tails. You have one uh well you have several genera actually that have can have two tails in beatity. Uh so nevertheless, um you see two tail, you see three tails, it's very much a giveaway. Three, if you see two, you still need to look at gills. And in these cases, uh, you know, you're going to mostly have gills on one through seven. You're going to have the abdominal gills. These are usually plate like gills. Okay, so body back to 13 prime, body elongate, streamline, you end up at, you go to 15. So with two or three well developed tails. If three tails present, <laughs> then the antenna is two to three times the head width in length. So if the, the length of the antenna, or a, it's a long antenna, some of them have shorter antennas. Um, this is kind of a, a, a tough little group, you know, but they are common. Next. And the reason I'm saying they're a tough group because they're the most diverse group in Missouri. There's, you know, around 15 genera of B to D. And they occur, they occur in all different kinds of streams, really small streams, you know, large rivers. They're fairly good swimmers. They're smaller. They're a lot smaller than the Isonychiidae, you know, the, the large metal mayflies. And they, they, the nickname for these guys is small metal mayflies. So. Kind of minnow mayfly kind of indicates, you know, they're fairly good swimmers. And uh, the average biotic index value really, I don't know how much it means when they're, you're putting an average on 15 genera, you know, at the family level. Uh, uh, so your average is four. Uh, but there are some fairly tolerant taxa in there to have an average of four. Okay, the map doesn't really, you know, tell you a lot. It's a really diverse family. They're all over the place. Next. Okay, couple more here, and these are interesting uh, to me in that I've learned a lot in the, in the last year or two about this family and then and the next family. And uh, this family being Amelitidae, and again, we have a lot more characteristics to go through on the key, but if we work our way down through those characteristics, uh, we eventually are getting the 15 where we make, we make a decision for 15 prime. So it has three well-developed tails, but this time the antenna, with the three tails, the antenna are shorter than two times the width of the head. So short antenna basically with three tails. And then on 16, this is where the mouth, the only time I think we're really needing to take a look at the mouth parts or at the family level. And so definite magnification is needed. And if you look at the bottom right, um, what we're looking for is these pectinates on the maxilla. There's a row of pectinate spines on the maxilla. Uh, and that is what we need to see in order to be sure that of sure of this family. Next. Uh, they're a little more widely you know, distributed than at first 
I might I might have thought. Uh, it's just that you don't collect them normally if you're doing like biological assessment work and and uh, in smaller rivers or or creek size uh, streams. Uh, you just don't find them a lot. And uh, what I found in the last couple of years is the <laughs> the reason I didn't think they were very common is because they're really can be really common in really small headwater streams. Uh, doing some studies down in the Ozarks and some very, very small streams that dry out during the the uh, most of the time during the summer. Uh, they're very common right now. As a matter of fact, they're emerging right now. Uh, and that's another reason we don't run across them early, you know, often is because they emerge early, early in the spring in these really very small streams. And the, the most of the reason they can exist there, uh, it, it, these guys and the next family is they have, when they lay eggs, those eggs can go into a resting staging, they can dry out. And so if they dry sort of slowly, and then they can spend this, you know, few months drop when the streams dry, the stream rehydrates in the fall and the eggs go ahead and hatch. And then the larva uh, or the nymphs develop pretty fast over the winter time and they emerge real early in the spring. So what we're finding now is the, you know, really good populations in these small forested headwater streams. Sorry, next, yes. And uh, the last family, Cyphlinuriidae, uh, again, bunch of characteristics to run through. Uh, short story is once you get down to 15 prime, uh, they have the three de developed well-developed tails, uh, the antenna shorter than the head, moved to 16. The maxilla do not have pectinate spines. And the gills are a lot fancier than amyleted. Amyleteds have a plate-like gill. These guys have flaps on their gills and a lot fancier looking. Next. Uh, in Cyphlinuridae, one genus, three species in Missouri. Again, they probably prefer stream. They prefer seem to prefer the edges of streams and pools. And they are fast swimmers. You know, they're very good swimmers. The and, and again, we're finding really good populations of these in some of those really small forested headwater streams. We think they are fairly sensitive uh, biotic index value of three. And you can see, you know, this distribution map where it has most of the what we've uh, sampled has been in the Ozarks, but again, we have three species here, so uh, there's probably a range of uh, conditions and where they they can live. Next, okay. Whew. So uh, the references I've used mostly uh, referred to were again uh, McCafferty, uh, 1981. Uh, Merrick Cummins is a good book. There's other, it's a great book. Matter of fact, I mean, if you want to get down to genus level, uh, there is a later edition. There's a fifth edition, actually, that's needs to be probably updated. And then uh, I, I list the photo credits, but uh, they were listed on each, each uh, photo, too. And uh, if you have any questions, be ready. And I'll, I'll leave that reference slide up um, because um, for those of you who stuck around uh, for this presentation, there will be a drawing for one edition of the a third edition of the Merritt and Cummins book um, for one lucky participant. So we're doing that for each one of these presentations. And let's see, Randy, I had uh, a great question from Mike Engel. Uh, because it relates to the stream team program. Um, if a uh, heptogeneity is a 7.5 and it's BI value, uh, doesn't it skew the BI when we are counting mayflies um, in our stream team sampling um, because they're considered the sensitive group? And this is a really great question. Yeah, I mean, the answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you have to live with what you can identify the level you can identify to. And so even here, you know, in stream team, we're talking order, just mayflies, period. Here we're even having problems at the family level, you know, with that biotics index value, because we're having to go with averages. But we're kind of going with the overall uh it, you know, pollution <clears throat> tolerance or sensitivity. This is the same thing with trichops. Uh, we basically say that trichops are sensitive. Uh, matter of fact, some states and some other agencies that, you know, for their, their volunteer level or whatever, they, they actually break uh, the hydrocycid caddis flies out because they are more, a little more tolerant than the rest of the caddis flies. So, it's a matter of balance. It's just a balance between what you can identify and, and the sampling effort and all those things that go into monitoring. Another question came in from Ron. Um, if they die after they fly, uh, maybe the same day or night, how long do they grow after hatching before they fly? Good question. Uh, as nymph, they definitely spend most of their lives life in the water as nymphs uh, and so then you get into uh, some terminology about uh, voltanism or voltine there so there are some mayflies it's just one generation per year some mayflies can do two to three generations per year and uh, and then some take a couple years, you know, they'll probably the larger ones. And that all, what I'm saying here, <laughs> all has to be taken in context, you know, it's like, I'm kind of referring to Missouri. When you look at the literature, you, you know, they'll say there will some three years to develop. Well, they might be talking about the same mayfly that grows farther north where it's cooler and they have a shorter growing season versus, you know, one that grows, you know, that lives farther south. So, all in all, uh, uh, I'd say most mayflies, eh, most mayflies probably take a year to to develop. So one generation per year. Great. Um, and also, we had a question on um, if we could clarify clarify parthenogenic. And oh, yeah, I did not. Yeah, I did not touch on that. Sorry. You know, this is probably the case in. Uh, several of the mayflies. Matter of fact, the one I mentioned, stenon stenonema uh, femoratum, the more common one, I've read that is parthenogenic also. And so parthenogenesis is when uh, no male needed, uh, just the female can develop fertile eggs that will hatch uh, without need of fertilization. And as you can, I don't know, you know, exactly, I don't know, you can say that sometimes they can, you know, develop eggs from fertilization and sometimes they don't need that. It kind of depends on uh, maybe the year, the weather year. Um, I think there's a lot of room there, to, you know, for research probably, but uh, I, uh, I do know that there are, you know, several known parthenogenic uh, species of mayflies, you know, so they don't need sexual fertiliz fertilization to lay uh, viable eggs. Great, thank you. And then uh, the last question that came in was about um, the Merritt and Cummins book. Um, and if, if that book has all the information covered today with the maps, habitat descriptions, et cetera, for Missouri, and actually, no, it's, it's North America. So it's the entire North American continent covered, um, and it does not have the distribution maps. However, it does give you some text um, on where you might be able to find those particular. Yeah, it's, it's a big book. It's a big one, um, but it's really focused on the keys for identification, um, some to the species level, but mostly to the genus level. Um, and then there's a really great appendix on what kind of habitat, what kind of functional feeding group um, that all of the aquatic insects might fall into. So not just EPTs, but dragonflies, beetles, true flies. Um, it's, it's pretty extensive. Very nice group. Very nice book, but very detailed. Yes. yes. 
Um, let's see, another question from Meredith. Uh, would parthenogenesis be related to more of the small streams that may dry up periodically? Possibly. Yeah, it might, you know, that I think there is a kind of a relationship there and and you have to think, I guess, evolutionary wise, ecology wise, you know, what's your chances of, you know, evolutionary wise, what do you think your chances? not that, you know, what do you think, but what are the chances of running across the mate when you only live a day and the streams drying out and conditioners are get conditions are getting harsh. You know, there's a lot of things that when conditions are uh, aquatic organisms, when conditions are getting harsh, when the thing, you know, temperature rises or when the drying out that they, they, a lot of aquatic organisms kind of shift life strategies or they are they're able to shift life strategies. So, yeah. Headwater streams, you know, a lot of these are common in the headwater. Oh, and Meredith wanted to see the book again. I actually have a photo. Um, let me see if I can pull this, that up. This is the fifth edition. And I think you're giving away the the third. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I saw the pages have increased from 857 in the third to this is 1100 in some pages in, in this latest edition. So if you can see that, this is the third edition. Um, and it's still a very valid book. Um, okay. Again, taxonomy changes over <laughs> over time. Um, my copy is very well loved. This is uh, it's frustrating to everybody that tries to identify things. <laughs> It's a, but it's it's based on relationships, you know. The taxon taxonomy is based on cha the ch changing knowledge of the relationships between these organisms. So uh, it just just happens, but it very rarely happens, you know, at the family level. Yeah. Well, and we let's see. We had another question. Oh, is there a reference for distribution of species just in the Ozark region, um, and then and when they emerge into terrestrial adults? So, do we have more localized life history type references that we could try to provide or uh, link to? I kind of think we don't, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I've generated maps. That's about. Um, I've got. I've. I've got two publications for mayflies of Missouri. Neither one of them are strict to the Ozarks, um, but they're just meant to be a distributional records, you know, records in Missouri. Uh, it's a be a much larger, I, and I, which I do not have, and I don't know of anybody else that has uh, tried to publish for mayfly Ozark mayflies. But there's maps of, of from we can draw from our database. So if somebody's interested in a particular particular critter uh, genus or and or species, we probably we may not be able to generate a species map because we in bioassessment work we have a little bit of difficulty going to species level at, at for some taxa, but definitely at the genus level we could we could generate uh, some distributional maps. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording, uh, but I do have a couple of other questions to address. Just a moment.